welcome to our uh, everyone here and any guests that may, we may have on the webcast today. Have you ever wanted to ask a question but were somewhat apprehensive that the answer wouldn't go the way that you had wanted or that you expected or preferred? And then when you worked up the courage to ask that question, and then sure enough, the answer wasn't quite what you had expected. Or perhaps you've been just flat turned down, where someone just said no. How'd that feel? Were you disappointed or perhaps even discouraged? I suspect we've all made a request at one time or another and gotten turned down. Maybe the answer to our question was no, but it was done in a gentle way. But the answer was still no, nevertheless. Maybe the answer we received was like a splash of cold water in our faces. Or maybe the answer received was simply quiet, no response at all, not even a tiny peep or a squeak to acknowledge our existence. So what do you do when you get a negative response, when you hear the word no, or when you simply don't get a response to your question? Today, I want to examine how several people in the Bible as, rec as recorded throughout the Bible, have responded when they did not get the answer that they were asking for. I've entitled this sermon, Ask, Ask, and Ask Again. The alternate title is The Value of Persistence. When I was a young man in college, my fellow students, the guys in the dorm, would share the reasons that they were rejected when asking a young lady for a date. One fellow said that his request for a date was rejected because the young lady said she had to wash her socks that evening. Another guy said he was rejected because his intended date would need to talk to her grandmother that evening. The reasons for the rejection went on and on. And after a while, some guys just gave up asking for dates because they were afraid of the rejection. The uh, So the first point, and we'll have five of them today, is I'm going to put them in the form of rules. Rule one. Don't be afraid to ask, but plan carefully. Let's take a look at Esther. And we may have an idea of what went on in the book of Esther uh, in the Bible, where a young woman who was selected as the new queen by King Ahasuerus, but the king did not know her background, did not know her heritage, did not know that she was a Jewish girl. And... So she had to be very careful what she said, who she said it to, and she followed the advice of her cousin, who was her, uh, uh, for whom she was the ward. Her parents were deceased, and and she, the previous queen, was deposed, and she was chosen as the new queen. But in that process of being chosen, she sought advice. And if we take a look and start in chapter, uh, uh, in, uh, and take a look in, in Esther chapter 2. We can uh, jump to chapter 2. I presume you can jump to it faster than I can. And we start reading in 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 uh, in chapter or in chapter two and verse five. Um, we read that Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom we call Esther. The girl was also known as Esther, and she was a lovely young lady. And the king then, as we read on through verse twelve, decided to select uh, a new queen. And the time came when she was to appear before the king, and and of course she asked advice as to what she should do. And and if we take a look on verse 14, she would, in the last part of the verse, she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. So if the king was, was happy with her, he would call her back. But if she did not get called by the king, she could not approach the king again. It was up to him to do the asking. In verse 15, And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So it was Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is in the seventh year of his reign. 
And the king loved Esther more than all, than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other unmarried women. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, and the feast of Esther for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the province and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Well, we have this quite an occasion. Everybody knew who the new queen was. He proclaimed it far and wide. He was pleased with his new pick. And then we enter in the story of a fellow by the name of Haman, and I'll pick it up in chapter 3, starting in, in verse 8. You see, Haman was one of the king's closest advisors. And Haman uh, had it in for the Jews. He said to King Ahasuerus, starting in verse 8, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from other people's. They do not keep the king's laws. So it's not fitting for the king to let them remain, if it pleases the king. Let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. In other words, I'll, I'll pay you, king, if you'll sign this law. I will contribute mightily to the king's treasury. So verse 10, the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, uh, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. And of course, we read on verse 13, there's letters that sent throughout the land and a copy was made. It was read and being published for everyone. So everyone would know this. We'll move on to verse 4. Now, uh, Esther's verse, uh, or chapter 4 and verse, uh, uh, verse 4. So Esther's maids and eunuchs, the men that cared for the neutered men that cared for the, uh, uh, the, the women in the palace, came and told her what was going on. And the queen was deeply distressed, and she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth. You see, Mordecai was mourning, so he put on sackcloth, and he was mourning. But Mordecai would not accept the clothing. He had to have proper clothing to come into the palace. Or to, and, and she wanted to know why, what was going on. And so she sent a servant um, out to get Mordecai, her cousin, who was her, uh, who was her guardian uh, prior to this. And that's when he communicated back to Esther what was going on. And... Now she was worried because all of her people would be subject to, to dying by the king's decree. We look in verse 10. Esther spoke to Haddish, the servant, and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes to the inner court to the king who hasn't been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. So, Mordecai said, you need to go tell the king to reverse this, make some changes here. And she said, but, but if I go to the king without being called, the law is that I'll be put to death unless he holds out the scepter. And she says, I haven't been called to come before the king for a month. You know, I'm like, what's the chances of this happening? I'm, I'm likely to be struck dead. <clears throat> Verse 13. In chapter 4, verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther this way. Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai was urging her, you must take the chance. You're going to have to ask the king to change his decree. So how did Esther go about this? How, she was perplexed. Now, how do I ask the king? Because just taking the chance means that I may very well die. Look what he did to the last king, queen. He disposed of her. We aren't given the details, but you know that that queen isn't around anymore. So what is she going to do? If we take a look in chapter 5, Esther had to think, how was she going to ask this question? In Esther, 5, or in Esther 5, verse 1, Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robe, stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, 
that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Step one. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. The king held out the scepter for her. He wasn't going to kill her for approaching. And so she was able to get close to the king enough to be able to ask him a question. So what question would you ask? You took a chance. You lived. Would you ask the king? Would you fall down on your knees now and ask for them to save all of your people? It's not what Esther did. In verse 3, And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What's your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Now let me say that when he says that, that is an expression of love, faith, and encouragement. That's not necessarily the way it's going to be. She says, yes, yes, I'd like that half of the kingdom. It's not exactly the way it's going to come out. It's, uh, In other words, I'm willing to give you anything reasonable that you ask whatsoever, if it's in my power to do so. And verse 4, so Esther answered, if it pleases the king, now watch what question she asks, let the king and, Naaman, and, and Haman come today to the banquet I have prepared for him. So did she ask a great and grand thing of the king? No. She asked a nice thing, a very comforting thing. The king felt good that his queen thought enough of him, instead of being despised and running the other way like the previous king, that she would invite him to a banquet and and uh, and be seen uh, be seen with him. And she invited his top advisor, uh, Haman, to come. And the king said, "Bring Haman quickly, that he may do as Esther has said." So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Now, a banquet is not a small thing. When you're roasting a sheep or an oxen, it takes a lot of time to prepare, and particularly one that's fitting a king who owns an empire that stretches from Ethiopia to India, which is a huge swath of the known world at that time. And so let's read in verse 6. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. So once again, the king says, What do you really want here? And I know it's not just for this banquet. Come on, come on. Let's, you know, let, let's get serious. What do you really want? What's, what request do you have here? And Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, then... It pleases, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I'll do as the king said. In other words, she says, why don't you come to another banquet? And then I will ask you. Well, first of all, she was seen in the courtyard asking to come to the permission in the presence of the king. Step one, she made it. She didn't die. Then she asked the king to come to a banquet, and he did. And then she asked the king, I'll tell you tomorrow if you come yet to another banquet. In other words, it's obviously the royal court. Everybody was a lot of intrigue going on here. What is happening? All of this partying going on with the king. So now we have in, in, in Esther in chapter 7, we have in starting in verse 1. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again asked, said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? She, um, it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom it shall be done. Now the king must have thought a lot of this young lady because she's now teased him to the brink where he just can't take it anymore. What is it you really want? Come now. And then, verse 3, And then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let me let my life be given me at my petition and the people at my request. Let's put that in a little better English. Let me live and let my people live. Well, this is a bit puzzling. But she goes on to explain, For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. In other words, if it was only to be slaves, we would accept this. But to be killed or annihilated, that, that's unacceptable. And so, verse 5, So King Ahasuerus said, answered and said to the queen, 
Who is he and where is he who would dare to presume in his heart to do such a thing? In other words, to kill all of the of Queen Esther's people. And Esther said, very scary now because the king's top advisor is right there in the room. And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. I can imagine in my mind's eye as they're sitting at the banquet table and the king's heart is a bit merry with the beverage and she turns and says, and it's this, the evil or wicked Haman, pointing right there to him because he's right there as a guest at the banquet as well. Well, that had to be a bit discouraging, obviously, for Haman, who was expect, you know, was really enjoying himself, you know, being in the royal palace. And so let's move on then in Esther 8 and verse 1. Uh, uh, at that point, uh, and there, there's more to the story <clears throat> that the king then was very upset with Haman. And, and as we read, as we read uh, before chapter 8, one of the palace attendants said, Look, there's the gallows that Haman uh, had prepared, or that Haman had prepared for Mordecai. Now, what they didn't know was that the king had had a sleepless night. And the king, in order to get back to sleep, had somebody reading him the royal history of how Mordecai had saved the king from an assassination attempt years before, because he put it in the history book of the kingdom. And so now he sees that Haman wanted to kill all of the Jews and he wanted Haman, uh, had designs uh, to hang, uh, 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 to hang uh, Mordecai. And yet Mordecai was the one that saved the king's life. So when the servant says, well, there's the gallows right out there. Now, 50 cubits is what? 50 times 18 inches is what? 75 feet high. That's pretty tall. So... Uh, I mean, you can see that for a goodly ways around. And apparently Haman wanted to make sure everybody could see that Mordecai was being hung. And the king said, hang Haman on those, <laughs> on the, uh, on those gallows. And that's what happened. And then he gave Mordecai, the intended one for the gallows, gave him Haman's property, decreed that he would have it. Ooh, that's a big turnabout. And let's take a look then at Esther one, or 8 and verse 1. And on that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So now the king knows they are related. The one that saved the king's life was related to the queen. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. In other words, there was a that hey, Mordecai inherited the household with all the property of Haman which is exactly what we read in the, in the Proverbs, and I didn't pull out which verse, is that one who wants to roll a rock on someone else, that same rock will roll back on them, and that's what happened here. Uh, Haman had in mind to take everything away from the Jews, and yet it wound up the other way around. And the signet ring, which is rather interesting, whoever held the signet ring could make commands in the king's name and then affix the seal, the king's seal to it. Because the king didn't want to be bothered with the little items, so he trusted somebody else to take care of the ordinary business so you could take a document and write it, put wax on it, and put the king's seal right on that document. And it was as if the king himself had done it. There was that much trust in there. So the king trusted Mordecai with that where he had previously trusted Haman, but Haman had lost the trust. Um, <clears throat> And verse 3, Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So yet again she asked a question. She had a supplication before him, implored him with tears. I know guys hate it when their wives come up and they're crying and they can't refuse a request because that's how it is, right? And it happened with King Ahasuerus. His wife has, was in tears. And it was a terrible, terrible thing that the law still existed, that all of these, all of her relatives and all of her people would die on a certain date and all their property would be confiscated. And, and if she, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and in verse 5 in chapter 8, she says, And if it pleases the king, and if I've found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, 
and I'm pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? How can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Uh, and of course, that couldn't be because the king could not revoke a command once given. It was their way. It was their law. You couldn't revoke it. Um, however, uh, however, Esther uh, engaged the king in this discussion in verse 12. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. <clears throat> because, you see, it was describing because Esther had asked that to eliminate the threat of retribution that Haman's sons, and there were ten of them, that they would also be killed under the king's order, and that would put a stop to the conspiracy to kill all of, of the Jews. So you have this terrible, terrible situation in which Haman... And you can imagine that she's half the age of the king uh, and the mightiest ruler on the face of the earth. And this scared girl has to come before and ask these questions, but not just once. She had to ask them wisely and she had to plan ahead instead of blurting it out at the beginning. But she had to have courage and the faith to be able to, to ask those questions. And she stood up to the job. So rule one, don't be afraid to ask. But plan carefully. Okay? Rule two, ask with determination. If we turn to Genesis 32, we can read this story in Genesis 32. And it's not a long story. I can probably paraphrase it. Uh, and it's at the time when Jacob and his family were leaving uh, uh, Laban from Syria and coming back to uh, coming back to uh, to the land of uh, of where uh, that he would have inherit would inherit from Abraham and Isaac, and so he's on his way back, and he hears that his brother, his twin brother Esau, has four hundred mounted or horsemen that are coming to meet him. And of course, he knew that he had tricked his brother for, in the inheritance matter, and his brother would be very unhappy with him. And so he was very worried, and he was on the way. And he, so he split uh, his family and belongings, half of everything he sent with Leah, half of it with Rachel. And if we read then in Genesis 32, verse 1, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And he said, This is God's camp. Now, I don't know how he recognized the angels of God, but he clearly did, and it was written for our understanding. And then we go down to verse 24, after Jacob had split his camp up into two different uh, parts and sent one each way, so that if his brother came to annihilate him and all of his family, he would only catch half of them at one, at least half the other half could get away. In verse 24, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not, meaning that this uh, this person Jacob was wrestling with, he did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Verse 26, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But, he's, but he, meaning Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 27, so he, the man, said to him, What is your name? And he said, and Jacob answered, Jacob. Verse 28, and he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he, the person he was fighting with, said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place uh, Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. We don't know have all the details of this particular encounter, but we do know this, that Jacob wrestled all night. Now, I've stayed up all night a few times in my life. I was not in peak form the next day. When the sun was coming up, I could not say that I was full of energy, enthusiasm, and vigor, and that I would be willing to take on anybody or anything. 
And yet Jacob wrestled all night. And what did the person he was wrestling with say? Let me go, for the day breaks. And Jacob responded, I will not let you go unless you bless me. How willing are we to grab a hold of a potential blessing? How determined was Jacob with the knowledge of, he had knowledge of, as to who he was wrestling. And so this particular occasion, we can know that it's okay to ask with determination. And Jacob had that determination and he did receive the blessing and his name at that point was changed to Israel. That's rule number two, ask with determination. And then rule number three, we have an example that we'll be coming up on here and we'll probably speak more of as we come up on spring holy days. And that is rule three, ask repeatedly. Ask repeatedly. In Exodus 5, um, or what leads up to the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were in, in uh, Egypt for over 400 years. And... Moses had, uh, was raised in, in uh, Egypt, had fled, left for 40 years, and at age 80 was called by God to go back and, re and help to rescue the children of Israel from Egypt. And Moses said, you know, I, I'm not very good at this talking thing. You know, my lips, they're not really, uh, you know, I can't speak well. And, and, and God said, okay, fine, I'll give you Aaron to be your spokesman uh, to help you out. So Moses and Aaron, then if we look in Exodus 5 and verse 1, they were told to go in to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. And let's read what happens. In Exodus 5, verse 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel. In other words, they're setting up, The message is really from God, the God of all of these people that you have enslaved. Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And verse 2. Now mind you, this particular Pharaoh is the strongest ruler in this region. Life and death at the snap of a finger. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now, that's the first couple of verses. Now let's go to verse 4. Because we can read now what happened to Moses and Aaron, in fact, the children of Israel. Uh, because things got worse for the Israelites. In verse 4, Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look at the people of the land are many, um, and you make them rest from their, from their labor. In other words, you're interrupting the work that we need get to get done. You know, why would you do that? And verse 6, So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it for their idol. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go sacrifice to our God. In other words, they want to go waste time. Well, rather than waste time here, we'll let them go pluck straw and get their own straw for the bricks. Verse 8, And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks they made before. You shall not reduce it for their idol. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. He thought this was all very silly. In other words, this, this nonsense about going into the wilderness reminds me of when my wife was in graduate school many, many years ago, I couldn't say many twice now, right? Many, many years ago. And she had a professor and she said that she was going to go to the feast. And this particular time she would need, need off. And the professor said, that's silly. <laughs> well, you know, the questions aren't good. The answer isn't going to be good after that. Uh, it was a very difficult time uh, to get through that circumstance. So then we follow down in verse 20 and we read that the Israelites were now blaming Moses and Aaron for even asking Pharaoh to let them go in the first place. Verse 20, and then as they came back out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. Verse 21, and they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. In other words, they're going to work us to death. And if we don't work to death, they're going to just kill us. Look what you, Moses and Aaron, have done. You went and had to ask him that. 
And Moses responded, or or reported to God. In verse 22, and he's telling God, hey, you know that asking thing that uh, you wanted uh, me and Aaron to do? Mm, Didn't work. I'm I'm not saying that it was a screw-up, but it didn't work, okay? So verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on this people? Why is it that you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to these people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. In other words, I don't understand. I did what you said. I asked, just like you said to ask, or we, meaning Moses and Aaron, and things got worse. Ever happened to you that way? You ask. And you meant well. I mean, and you had it all down. You, had, you know, and, and, and things didn't get better. You didn't get what you asked. It got worse. Well, we know as we read through the book of Exodus that Moses and his spokesman, Aaron, came before the Pharaoh how many more times? Another ten times. And hence we have the stories of the plagues and so forth. And it was ten more times. And nine of those times, nine more times, or a total of ten times that that they asked, that Pharaoh said what? No, you're not going to go. And that was the eleventh time after ten plagues. What did Pharaoh say? Not only, not only go, go quickly and take your stuff. And then he even reneged on that afterwards. Can we say to ourselves, well, yeah, yeah, that was Moses. And the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. My problems are a little different. You know, I'm insignificant in the world. Why should anyone listen to me? I mean, you know, after all, I'm not, I didn't see the burning bush. I'm not Moses. I'm not Aaron. I don't carry the rod that budded and produced almonds and and swallowed snakes and all this others. You know, yeah, that was different. But when I ask a question, I'm just little old me. Doesn't matter yet. So that brings us to rule four. Um, rule three, I should uh, uh, should repeat rule three. Um, was to ask repeatedly. So now let's go to rule four. And this may sound redundant. Rule four is ask yet again. Let's turn to Luke 18 and verse one. I want to read a parable that Christ spoke. The parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18 and verse 1. Then he, meaning Christ, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Oh, so he's trying to encourage them. Do you always get the answer you want when you pray? And here Christ is giving the instruction always ought to pray and not lose heart. And then what does he say? Verse 2. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And verse 4. And he would not for a while. And then, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. You suppose the widow came more than once? Because what did the judge say? Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Do you weary someone by coming once? No. We have the example here that Christ said about prayer that we should be persistent. And then he gives the example of this widow who should have been the most taken care of one in society, the orphans and widows. And the judge wasn't regarding God or man. He was a big shot. He didn't have to do any of this. And yet she kept at it. The word continually kept at it. Her persistence was there. And verse 6, And then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Well, let's have enough faith to cry out to God for ourselves, for others, for the work of the church. Will God find such faith 
on the earth at the return of Jesus Christ? That was a question. And it's up to us to come up with the answer for our individual lives. So if we look at rule four, it's to ask yet again, just as the widow did. In rule five, ask, but know when to quit. Rule five is to ask, but know when to quit. I want to turn to Genesis 13. I want to turn back to Genesis 13, and let's do the backstory on this. We had uh, the time of Abraham, then called Abram, and his nephew Lot, and they had migrated to the land of Canaan, and they were living together. Both of their flocks and herds were together, and their families, and there was strife between them, between the two, because they were living together, and sometimes that doesn't work out when two households are living in the same area. As they say, what is it, relatives and fish after three days in the house? Maybe they both begin to stink. Well, I suspect the stink level here was kind of high between Abraham and Lot. So then we read in Genesis that Abraham says, look, and then called Abraham, look, you know, look, we have all this land. If you take to the left, I'll take to the right. And if you take to the right, I'll take to the left. And and we read that Genesis 13, 8. Law, Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. We are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Separate from me. You take the left, I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. And this is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So it was like the garden of the Lord, the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. Verse 11, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. like, And Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Then it throws this little note on verse 13. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So Lot went in the direction of Sodom with all of his great possessions, all of his livestock. And then there was a time, and I'm going to skip through up here to Genesis 18, and a little bit of the backstory again here, that that uh, that will pull. We'll do this, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm sure you read the story where, where a couple of angels visited Abraham and Sarah, told Sarah that she and her, in her, uh, told Abraham actually in his older years he and Sarah would have a child. And of course, Sarah laughed, but indeed it came about, and so that was a visit at that time. And then we read on uh, after that visit. Of Genesis 18, verse 16. And the men rose from there, meaning visiting Abraham and Sarah, and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And when the Lord said, and the Lord said, meaning he was must have been speaking presumably to the angels, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord's, verse 20, and the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Verse 22, And the men turned from there and went to Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, w And Abraham, now, now notice, what did Abraham do? He was curious. In fact, boldly so, because he knew that his nephew and all of that family headed towards Sodom. So what does Abraham have the courage to ask God? Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? For be it far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Should not the judge of all earth do right? Verse 
So Abraham now is questioning, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, you know, I don't understand. How can you destroy all of the wicked people there, but then kill 50 righteous people? And verse 26, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, I will spare all of the place for their sakes. So we have a deal going here. Abraham asked. And what did God say? Okay, for 50, I'll spare the whole thing. Now, I don't know the population of Sodom, whether it was a thousand or 50,000 or a hundred thousand. I, I don't know. But if there were only 50, he would spare the place. Verse 27, and Abraham answered, indeed boldly, I must say, and he said, indeed, now, I who, I who am but dust and ashes, he understood his relationship to his creator, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Do we take it upon ourselves to speak to God, to ask him? Even though we're, you know, what dust and ashes are, just that's what we all, that's what we're made from. We eat and the food comes from the ground. And so we're all made of those same things that come from the ground, the dust and the ashes of the earth. And so Abraham understood that, that he was the created being and he was talking to the creator. And Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now, who am I but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord? Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for the lack of five? Oh, well, if 50 is going to work, how about just 45? Will that, will that maybe work out okay? Will you spare the city? And I could probably see the mindset of law, of, of Abraham because he knew how many people were in Lot's household, how many servants he had and their families and so forth, that surely, you know, maybe they would be spared, the 50. Well, maybe 45. Okay, maybe there's some that are on the border or the fringes. But but, but 45, would you, would you go 45? Sort of like a reverse auction we have going here. And verse 29, and he spoke to him yet again, and, and or verse uh, uh, 28. He said, if I find 45, I will not destroy it. In verse 29, and he spoke to him yet again, meaning Abraham spoke to God again and said, suppose there should be 40 found there. And God said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. And then we keep going. Verse 30, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 shall be found there. So first we went to increments of five, first from 50 to 45 to 40. And now he's jumping down to 30. Well, he's agreeing so far. Let's speed this up a little bit. And he also was respectful. He said, you know, ask God, don't don't be angry with me, but I'm approaching this, you know, I, I'm pleading their case for them. Uh, what about 30? And he, meaning God, said, let, uh, 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 and, or in verse 29, I will, or verse 30, he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Verse 31, indeed, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. In other words, I know this must really be irritating because I've done this how many times now? Suppose uh, 20 should be found there. And God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Verse 32, and then Abraham said, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he, God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. You notice that Abraham put a limit on it. It wasn't going to be totally unreasonable here. He didn't say, okay, well, what about nine, eight, seven. He said, I'll ask one more time. He put a limit to it. He understood that there had to be a limit at some point. So verse 33, the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. It was over. Abraham recognized that. He had done his best. He had asked repeatedly and had gotten a favorable response every time even down to the 10, if I find 10. Abraham stopped bargaining. He knew when to quit. Do we know when to quit? We're to ask, and we've seen all the examples about asking and asking again, and we've learned how to prepare to ask. And so, do we understand how to set the limit? If we look in Psalm 90, verse 12, what is the goal and purpose in this life? 90 verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What is wisdom? The understanding of taking knowledge, 
and rightly applying it. So that we may gain a heart of wisdom, not just wisdom, but a heart of wisdom, a way of life that we learn to make good decisions. We can follow that in Proverbs 3 and verse 13. What is the results of be using wise decisions in Proverbs 3, 13? Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. And so that's where Abraham was. He was exercising wisdom. He was putting a limit on what he was asking and not an unreasonable limit. You know, there are even non-Christians have discovered the rules of, not, of asking. There's a, a, a book that some of you may have read 20 or 30 years ago. A fellow by, author by the name of Robert Ringer. He wrote a number of uh, books. He's even got a website yet to say, I don't know how old the fellow is, uh, but certainly an interesting author. And uh, read, you can find him at robertringer.com. And he wrote the 10 Never Fail Rules of Success. And you can go to online to robertringer.com and, and look up his 10 Never Fail Rules of Success. Rule number one is to ask. Rule number two is to ask again. Rule number three is to ask yet again. And rule number four is to ask again. Rule number five is to ask still yet again. Rule number six is to still ask again. Rule number seven, and I think you know where we're going, for the ten times. And he said, interestingly enough, it continually amazes him that people do not get what they seek because they fail to ask again. That's not the, of course, we're all looking for an answer. And we all want a favorable answer. And we don't always understand a favorable answer might not be the one we want to hear. Uh, and I thank God for unanswered prayer as the, uh, as the old country song goes sometimes. Boy, I'm sure glad I didn't get what I'd asked for there. So that's where the wisdom comes in. Um, there's a book, and uh, uh, I used to work for a Taiwanese-owned company, and I was the white face of the company, as it were, that spoke English in America. And I had a number of uh, uh, employees that whenever I had a new Anglo employee on staff, I gave them a book. Because the employees never knew, could never understand how I was the only person the company ever hired that got me a new desk, new office equipment, new this, new that, new chair, just everything was all, and they said, they don't do that. What, what happened? How did you do it? I said, you have to know how to ask. And, well, how do you do that? I said, stick with me long enough and you'll understand. Each new employee that came in, I gave them a copy of a book. And the book was entitled The Asian Mind Game by Chen Ning Chu, written in 1991. And this book was rather interesting. It had six categories of deception that you had to learn if you were to understand how to do business with Asians. And there were six categories, and then within each category, because the number six is the number of deception, and each category had six strategies on how to deceive your adversary. And one of those strategies was, and so there were 36 deceptions in six categories. And this is not a Western mindset. Uh, the lady was that wrote it was actually brilliant. Chen Ning Chu was, grew up in Manchuria, in northern China at a time under Japanese occupation prior to World War II. Uh, uh, and grew up on, across the river from the Koreans. So she saw three cultures, the Chinese, the Korean, and the Japanese culture, and played with all the kids. And then in the revolution of 1949, communist revolution in China, she fled with her family to Taiwan, which has a slightly different culture. And then when she was an, an adult, she came to America for her formal post-secondary education. And she wrote this book because she could explain herself very well in English, but she also could think in multiple Asian languages and cultures. And so one of the 36 deceptions is how to gain superior control over one's adversary. And the way that's done is to ignore a question. Simply remain silent. Don't answer at all. And so as a result, whoever you're asking has, uh, uh, gives you no information. You don't know what it is. And so that was very, very helpful for me when negotiating with the contracts that we did from the various suppliers from Asian countries was to learn 
not to say anything at appropriate times. And then, and, and they had no idea that I had read the book, which was rather interesting uh, for them. And so it was a rather successful negotiating technique when I used their own techniques on them. Uh, and was uh, and so I'd say it was uh, was rather interesting. But you see, how to answer the question? They did not follow these rules, the Robert Ringer ones, who copied them out of the Bible, whether he realizes it or not, to be the persistent widow, to ask but know your limits, as in Abraham, or to ask appropriately and plan ahead, as Esther did, or how to uh, how to ask uh, from a position of strength, as Jacob did. Uh, to continually ask because they didn't know how to respond. They had never come across a Westerner who was just quiet and did the same thing they did. But you see, you have to know how to answer as well, but understanding how to ask. We're instructed to ask if we look in Matthew 7, in Matthew 7, in verses 7 through 12, in Matthew 7, And you're probably ahead of me on this one, Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. And seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you to those who ask him? In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. How interesting that we are instructed to ask and not be afraid to ask. And as we've learned from those examples, it's okay to ask more than once and to plan our asking. Let's take a look then at John 13. In John 13... In uh, starting in verse 13, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 13, starting in verse 13, you call me master and you say, well, for so I am. If I then am your Lord and master, have washed your feet. Uh, let's see if I have the right uh, one here. Uh, it's John 14. I was one chapter off on my notes. John 14, uh, chapter uh, verse 13. There we go. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. For if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And now notice it doesn't stop there. If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's a condition here that's all wrapped up together. That are we going to ask? Are we going to ask amiss? Because if we're keeping God's commandments, we're in a better frame or a better position for God to help us by in his response. Now I'll just turn just a little over to John 16. And John 16 and verse 23. John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say to you, whoever shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive. And then what does it say? That your joy may be full. That's reason to ask, isn't it? That your joy may be full. Now, is it always that we get the answer that we want when we want it? No. Does God say, well, ask once and then give up? No. Okay, let's turn then to uh, last verse in Ephesians. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20. In Ephesians 3, in verse 20. I'm going to read this in the NIV. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power... <clears throat> 
that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and the Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. God is able to deliver far more than we could ask. Immeasurable means it's so much we couldn't possibly imagine. It's not measurable. It's not like you have a yardstick and you get to the end of the 36 inches. It's immeasurable. It's so much beyond that. And there, yes, people have calculated out how much sand of the sea there is. But you can take a cubic foot of sand, break it down, what's a smaller amount, and, and project. You can measure that. This is immeasurable. It's beyond the sand of the sea that God is capable of doing that. So when we look at the issue of asking, we look at rule one. Don't be afraid to ask, but plan carefully. Queen Esther built up courage by repeatedly asking the king's favor and then boldly came to do that, uh, to ask her ultimate uh, question with the king. Rule two, ask with determination. Jacob wrestled all night and wouldn't let go until he received the blessing. Rule three, ask repeatedly. Moses repeatedly entreated Pharaoh over ten times. Rule four, ask yet again. The importunate widow bothered the judge continually. And rule five, ask, but know when to quit. Abraham bargained with God over Lot's family in Sodom, and he exercised wisdom when knowing when to quit asking. We've been given a guidebook on how to approach God and our fellow man. That guidebook is here. Let's use that guidebook, the Bible, to reach the potential that God has in store for us. Music.